be with you folks again. It's, it's been a while. I was trying to uh, think about that while we were singing the last time that the Lord allowed me opportunity to preach here. And I don't remember what it was because I don't know if this is true with you, uh, but when it comes to the pandemic and all the uh, requirements for masks and shutdowns and things like that, it's just a blur. But somewhere in there, I was here. So uh, I do remember that because we had masks on and still things like that. But it's good to be with you today. And uh, good to be back with the folks of Berean. I know several of you, and I've been privileged to uh, get to know you a little bit better. So I'd like you to ask, ask you to open your Bibles this morning to a couple of different passages. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 1 and Romans chapter 7. 1 John chapter 1 and Romans chapter 7. I like that uh, clock on the back wall. That's always helpful to a, a guest preacher, rather than a trap door behind the pulpit, uh, to indicate the proper time to uh, shut down the sermon. So uh, I'll, I'll be mindful of your time this morning. Uh, but I also want to share with you something. I prayed about this for quite a while, uh, because a particular topic I believe the Lord has led me to preach this morning uh, is, is well suited to a Bible study. Uh, where you're maybe sitting around a table with a notebook and you can engage in conversation. And so part of me struggled to, to have this in sort of a Sunday morning format. Uh, and I, I hope that the Lord will give me grace and that you will uh, learn and, and be uh, encouraged by what the Lord has for us this morning. So I want to ask a question that's going to lay the groundwork for all of this and uh, maybe get your, your brain waves firing this morning in a way where we can learn. So the question is this. Are you an authentic person? It's kind of an odd question. You mean, I, authentically, I am a human. Uh, is that what you're talking about? But I'm asking you to think along the lines of spiritu spirituality or Christianity. Are you an authentic person? Are you, as a Christian, known to be authentic? So what I mean by authentic, and here's just a definition for you to, uh, to think about. It means, authentic means of undisputed origin or genuine. Genuine is another word that uh, may lead us in a direction that I hope us to go this morning. Are you a Christian that is known to be genuine? Here's another question that I can ask, and it ties into being authentic. Are you a Christian who is walking in the light? Are you walking in the light? Think about that. 1 John chapter 1 speaks about the importance of walking in the light. And uh, this passage begins by holding us, telling us this wonderful possibility of having greater fellowship with God and with other people. So we'll spend just a couple of minutes in 1 John chapter 1, but the priority and majority of our time this morning will be in Romans chapter 7. But 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship is a great word. Fellowship is a great, uh, it's a great thing. Because what fellowship means is having a warm and, and intimate relationship with someone. We enjoy fellowship with one another. We, as Baptists, enjoy fellowship around the table, don't we? We enjoy fellowshipping and, and eating. And we just enjoy uh, the, the idea of, of having this close friendship, this, this uh, knowledge of, of the fact that we belong to the Lord, that we're saved. And uh, quite literally, when you actually talk about biblical fellowship, you're actually communicating about the Bible and about doctrine and about uh, what God is doing in our lives. And to enable to, in order to have fellowship one with another, we share, of course, the relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's possible even to have fellowship with Jesus Christ, to have a friend in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. And I hope uh, that you know what it means to be a friend of Jesus. Imagine the possibility of having that warm, intimate relationship with the God of heaven and earth. And I hope you don't have to imagine. I hope that you experience that. Now, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. 
So the principle is clear there that fellowship comes with God from walking in the light. Now, that's all well and good, and, and that's, uh, that's what I, I want us to understand this morning, but what exactly does that mean, walking in the light? You know, sometimes we, we spout off Christian phraseology, and we don't exactly know or understand what it means. So what does it mean to walk in the light? Perhaps I could ask you the question, this past week, have you been walking in the light? And then what evidence would you give to back that up? I'm not asking you to think about that and speak out loud, but think in your mind, have I been walking in the light this week? And if I were to have to testify to that, what would be the evidence that I would give? Well, verse 8, 9, and 10 help us so much with this because what we see here is what is required in order to be able to walk in the light. Verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Aren't you glad to know that walking in the light means not sinless, that you have not messed up in any way, that you've not misspoke or, or had a temper or gotten angry or sinned in any way? Because if we say we have no sin, we just deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. A Christ-centered grace-based approach to spiritual growth that will account for the importance of our relationship with Christ will accomplish way more than a man-centered, fear-based, legalistic approach, which really accounts for almost all other religions. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, a faith-based, Christ-centered approach is that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, by His grace. And we are not... Uh, uh, there's nothing else required for salvation, uh, a duty that we have to do, some, some ritual we have to perform, some law we have to keep. That is a man-centered approach, right? That's what we often feel like, well, you know, we have to do things. That's why it's quite easy to deceive people uh, into thinking salvation is, is something that has to be more complex than a free gift. That just doesn't make sense. You have to do something to earn your salvation. Well, that's what man says, but God says no. Sa salvation is by grace through faith. And this is what light does. Light, it exposes. John chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So the idea is, fellowship with God comes from walking in the light. And walking in the light means that we have an open attitude towards admitting our own sinfulness. And that would mean, of course, that pride would have to be dealt with. And we know uh, I, I, I'm certain that everyone within the sound of my voice this morning likely knows that God does not like pride, right? In fact, a word we heard this morning in Sunday school, God hates pride, does he not? And so pride would have to be dealt with. So the next question I ask you this morning is, how can I know if I'm doing that, Pastor Tricky? How can I know if I am walking in the light? And that's probably where one of the most well-known verses in 1 John chapter 1 comes into play. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And if you know this passage, you say, praise the Lord for this passage, because it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So show me a person who is walking in the light, and I will show you a person who is regularly confessing sin to God. This is what I want us to understand this morning. I want us to be authentic. I want us to be able to, to be open about the fact that we are sinners and we are in need of God's grace and we're in need of God's forgiveness. And what will enable us to be authentic is being open with the fact that we are indeed sinners. Most of us would say that can't be hard to do. Uh, and and uh, it's not always, it just doesn't come naturally. First John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, good word, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you know the book of Romans very well, uh, you will know that word propitiation. You'll recognize it. Or, or we could say a, a, a satisfaction or a 
an appeasement, if you will. That's part of the position that each person who has genuinely placed their faith and trust in Christ now enjoys. Jesus is our advocate. He is our propitiation. So how does all of this fit together theologically and logically? So I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because I plan to explain it now as we go a little bit further. The more we understand and value our position in Christ, the easier it is for us to walk in the light, to have an open attitude towards admitting, admitting our sinfulness. And don't worry, I'm not suggesting here that uh, we have an SA group, you know, Sinners Anonymous. Good morning, I'm Jared Tricky. I'm a sinner. Uh, most of you knew that already, right? Because we're all sinners. I'm not suggesting that we're going to stand here and, 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 and confess sin to one another. But folks, I am saying this is what an authentic Christian does. You admit that you are a work in progress. You admit that you're not perfect. You're humbled. You're not self-righteous. You're completely dependent upon Christ for your salvation and for forgiveness. So when I ask you at the beginning of the sermon this morning, are you, are you authentic? This is, this is what I had in mind. And this is the exact point, I believe, that Paul discusses in Romans chapter 7, and where I would like you now to turn, and we'll spend the rest of our time this morning. I want to show you this morning how a Christian can be authentic. An authentic Christian will be a Christian who is at peace. Why? Because you are not worried about striving to, to do things in order to keep or be saved. Aren't you glad you don't have to earn your salvation, that that belongs to the Lord? We would be in big trouble, would we not, if we had to do specific things, behave certain ways? Now, I'm also going to show you this morning how because our, our relationship to the law has changed through our faith in Christ, we ought to keep the law, and our motivation to do so is out of love for our Savior. So that's important. Don't think I'm going to stand here this morning and say that keeping the law is not important. It most certainly is, but it's, it's something that we do out of love for the Lord. If you're new uh, to studying Scripture, you will, you'd like to probably understand that Romans 6, 7, and 8 in the New Testament is the most extended discussion of the topic of Christian growth found anywhere in the Word of God. I think I'm safe in saying that. And so if you want to, to learn more about that, Romans is a great book to study. But I want to read a couple of verses before we get into chapter 7 from chapter 6. So you'll likely just have to, to, to turn your eyes over to Romans chapter 6 uh, and verse 11 and 12. And let me just say, our union with Christ is incredibly powerful, and it provides strength to walk in the light. As Christians, we've died to sin and have been raised to new life in Him. So our responsibility is now to learn to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin. Look at verse 11 of Romans 6. The Scripture says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through, our Lord Jesus, through, our, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, that's how the gospel transforms us. Now, it's, it's, it's time to, to see how the assurance of our position in Christ frees us to be authentic with what still needs to be changed. And Paul is such a great character in Scripture to, to uh, show us that. He, he really is so honest. He's so authentic. And we'll see that as we read in Romans chapter 7. So as I read Romans chapter 7, I want you to be looking for reasons that the gospel produces genuine and practical holiness. And you may want to pay also attention to the word law, L-A-W, because it appears multiple times in this text, and we're going to talk about it. So let's look at Romans chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse 1. The Bible says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. There's the word. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Doesn't that make complete and perfect sense? It does, and that's the picture of what he now is about to explain, beginning in verse 4. 
Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we're delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And Paul gets real here. This is authentic Paul. Verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's an important verse. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So how are we free to be authentic? Let's work our way through these verses this morning and look for reasons the gospel produces authentic, real, and practical holiness. Can you relate with what Paul was saying there? I hope you're sort of getting an understanding of, of what he's trying to get across. And of course, uh, we, we obviously understand that Scripture is inspired of God. So this is God's Word to us. All right, this is not, this is Paul who's the human instrument and he's using his own experience to explain this. But this is what God wants us to understand and God wants us to see. I think probably the most surprising aspect uh, of these verses is when Paul acknowledges what he does in verse 19. How many of you find comfort in verse 19? For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. That sounds a lot like walking in the light, as I said at the beginning of the sermon this morning. Having an open attitude towards admitting our own sinfulness. Interestingly enough, it's the exact opposite way that Adam and Eve responded in the Garden of Eden. How did they respond? Remember when they got caught, essentially, they hid, they covered themselves, they blamed each other, they even blamed God. How, did, how could Paul be so authentic? What enabled him to walk in the light? Well, that's where our first point comes into the equation this morning. You're free to be authentic because your salvation is secure. We believe in the security of our salvation. Amen? Once saved, always saved. God is the one who keeps that and you cannot take that from God. You are saved, and your, your salvation is secure. So the first six verses of chapter 7 contain ideas that uh, they're a little bit shocking, but they're helpful, and they stretch our mind and are crucial for the Christian growth process. So Paul starts by affirming that the law has no jurisdiction over you any longer. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion 
over a man as long as he liveth. Now, you've probably noticed the word law is a major emphasis. It's used 23 times in this chapter, uh, eight times in the first six verses. So one of the challenges, obviously, we face is, is how that word is used, because it's used in different ways in Romans, and it's even used in different ways in this chapter. For instance, in verse 1, Paul's talking about any law, even, even secular law. But the point is, the only time any law has authority over you is if you are alive. That's a simple point, right? It's almost like you want to say, duh, I mean, I totally get that. Uh, if I'm alive, then, I, then this is the only time that it has any kind of authority over my life. You know, if a criminal dies, he's no longer subject to persecution, or excuse me, prosecution, uh, or, or judgment, no matter how numerous and heinous his crimes may have been. I consider uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was, uh, of course, the uh, history, if you're, if you're not a conspiracy theorist, uh, was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy, one of the presidents down in the United States. Now, he was not prosecuted. He didn't have to speak for himself in front of a jury. He didn't have to spend time in jail. Why? He was dead, right? He got killed. And so he was no longer responsible in that sense for those crimes. Now, to be clear, Paul is not saying this because there's anything wrong with the law. In fact, we should be like the psalmist in Psalms 119, verse 97. It says, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So why do we need to, be, why do we need to find a way to get out from under its jurisdiction? Why do we need to find that way? Paul's saying this because of how the law impacts us apart from Christ and his righteousness. In and of ourselves, we never measure up. Maybe get, get that into your head, get that in your heart. In and of ourselves, we never measure up. We experience constant guilt and, and fear and shame or pride and, and defensiveness and self-righteousness when we try in and of ourselves to keep the law. Later, we'll see that it actually incites rebellion in our hearts and bears the fruit of death. If you were listening when we read, we actually read a verse that says uh, almost exactly that. So, we have to find some way to change our relationship to the law. We need to find a way to do that. There's another great benefit of our union with Christ we see in chapter 6, and that's our reconciliation. Lee Harvey Oswald isn't the only dead person in this conversation. So are you and I if we are uh, trusting Christ as our Savior. For authentic believers, then we are free to be authentic because you died to the law and were married to Christ. Am I, am I making sense? You are now dead to the law and alive to Christ. And Paul uses this great illustration uh, to help us to see that. It's what happens when a person's, spouse, a person's spouse passes away. Verse 2, if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. He says the same thing in verse 3, if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. And we would all say, of course, that's, that's true. That's the, even the nature of our wedding vows. You know, I would, would say something like, for uh, better or for worse, for richer and poorer, uh, till what? Till death do us part. So, so we understand that that's, that's how that works. The point is, when a spouse passes away, it changes the nature of the surviving spouse's relationship and responsibilities to the one who has passed away. That, that's what happens to be a Christian. You are released from the law in the sense that you no longer wrongly believe that you have to keep it in order to be saved. It can't accuse you anymore in the sense that you can't say you're not saved because you failed in some way. Oh, I sinned. I must, I must not be saved. This is, this is the kind of, of relationship we must have to the law in order to, to know Christ. It's, it's because it is, you're standing now before God. If you're a saved person, you're standing before God on the finished work of Christ and his imputed righteousness to you. This is a wonderful thing. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you are permanently stamped with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That means what, no matter what, you, when, when, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. You're stamped with his righteousness. That's why the words such as redemption and propitiation and reconciliation and justification are such delicious words. If you understand what they mean, it is, it is phenomenal uh, how wonderful it is to know the Lord. It doesn't mean that the law was ever bad or that it was unimportant and that we shouldn't strive to keep it. 
Uh, it's just right-sized with our belief in the Lord and our salvation. You have allowed it to fulfill its ultimate purpose, which was to draw you to Jesus Christ. Prove that, Pastor Tricky. Well, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says this, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now you might say, well, does that make me like a spiritual widow or a spiritual widower? Well, the answer to that is in Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I love that phrase, become dead. Uh, it, it emphasizes the completeness and, and finality, if you will, of death. That verb is also a passive, so it's, it's indicating that believers do not die naturally or, or put themselves to death, but have been made to die by a divine act of God in response to faith in His Son. The law has power only to condemn men to death for their sin, but no power to redeem them from it. And that's where people begin to get off base. What do I have to do in order to be saved? This is why if you're, you're presenting salvation to somebody who's never been saved before, a lot of times one of the barriers you have to break through is, is, is for them to understand it really is a simple free gift. It's by faith in Jesus Christ, by His grace. And, and, and sometimes they, they have a very difficult time understanding it can be that simple. Paul has already pointed out that God's grace extended by faith in Jesus Christ brings death to the freedom of and death to and freedom from sin. He now declares that faith in him also brings death to the law and consequently freedom from the law's penalty. And that is good news for sure. You don't have to, to pay the penalty for breaking the law. Jesus Christ has already paid that penalty for you. He paid it on the cross for your sin and for mine. We see in verse 4 of Romans chapter 7, when it says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead. The verse I just read, to the law by the body of Christ. This is one of the primary reasons that, that grace-based sanctification is so far superior to excessive adherence to, to, to laws or rituals. and It's so more effective than that than in producing genuine, authentic, practical holiness. Because you are now doing the things of the law out of love for the Savior. It's actually an incredible metaphor. We are married to Christ. We're married to Him. To, to be a Christian is to fall in love with Jesus and to enter into a, 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 a personal, legal, comprehensive relationship with Christ. You know, when you get married, it literally changes everything about your life. You know, so, so though Christians are now not under the law, they have every aspect of their lives changed by the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, there's, there's not an area that's untouched. So being married to Christ is the final answer to the question that sometimes we get asked. Well, this free gift of salvation, and you say you can't lose it. Well, that, can a Christian just live as they want to with no consequences? Can we just do whatever we want? Is it a license to sin because of how easy it is and how we're kept by the power of God? I always answer that question with no. You're not free to just live as you want because we're in love with Jesus Christ. And, how, you know, when you think of your spouse, if you're married here this morning, if you love your spouse, you don't, you don't have to just do things. You want to avoid the things that displease your spouse. You want to do things that bring them joy. And so you, you, you go out of your way to, to make your spouse happy or to avoid uh, disappointing them. <clears throat> it's acting out of affection and not duty. So a couple of questions for you to consider. How are you doing at, or what are you doing to, to get to know your new spouse, your Savior? How are you getting to know the things that He likes, the things that He prefers? The pri primary way to know your spouse is, is to read your spouse's love letter to you. And of course, the love letter I'm referring to is the Bible. You get to know Jesus by studying the Word. The one who, who, who died so that you might live. The one who was a man of sorrow so that you might have joy. The one that took the shame of your nakedness so that you could wear His righteousness. 
Get to know Him. Get to love Him and do the things that please Him. You do that personally through, through Bible study, through church attendance, through, through you, 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 you can just name the things that, that we can do to grow in our relationship with the Lord. And in doing that, you're putting yourself in a position that you're exposed to the way of life that your new spouse loves. You're free to be authentic because your salvation is secure. You're free to say, I still struggle with sin. You're free to say that I still have to uh, daily confess my sins to God. You're free to do that because you know your salvation is secure. And just because you messed up doesn't mean you've lost that salvation. So you can be real. You can say, we're not perfect. There's a bumper sticker I used to, uh, I used to see it all the time. It said, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And that is true. Uh, we are perfect in the eyes of God, though, because we're stamped by the righteousness of Christ. But we are forgiven, and we still struggle with sin, and Paul does a great job of explaining that. So we're free to be authentic because our salvation is secure. Also, because the Holy Spirit enables us to live and serve with an entirely different motivation. Verse 6 of chapter 7. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I was reading a commentator on this particular passage and I like what he said here. He said, the law is still important to the Christian. And I would reiterate that. I hope no one's thinking that the law is not a big deal. It is. But it's still important to the Christian. He says, for the first time, he's able to meet the law's demand for righteousness because he has a new nature and God's own Holy Spirit to empower his obedience. And although he's no longer under the law's bondage or penalty, he's more genuinely eager to live by its godly standard than is the most zealous legalist. With full sincerity and joy, he can say with the psalmist, oh, how I love the law. Do you know how you, you appeased the law's demand for righteousness? You know how you did that? You gave it to Christ, and you trusted in Him to do that for you. And He is, and will, and does do that for you. As believers, we're dead to the law as far as, it demands, as far as its demands and condemnations are concerned. But because we now live in the newness of the Spirit, we love, and we serve God's law with a full and joyous heart. We want to do the things that please Him. And we know that to obey His law is to do His will, and that to do His will is to give Him glory. So does the Christian ignore the moral law of God? Not at all. We now look at it as an expression of God's desires. He desires honesty. We ought to be honest. He desires purity. We ought to be pure. He desires us to be generous and to be truthful and to have integrity and to be kind. He desires that, and we know He desires it because the Scripture instructs us on that. So we want to keep the law. We use the law now to please the one who saved us. We want to please the Savior. We want to please our bride. So we are not under the law. We're not married to it. We're married to Christ, and we're seeking to please Him. And so the law's precepts are a way to honor and love Him. They're, they're a way for us to show how we care for Him. They're not a burden. We have a new motivation, a love for our spouse, and we obey in our new framework. It's acceptance on the basis of Christ, not us fulfilling the law. So one question I want to ask you this morning, I want you to think about this. What does your joyful obedience to the moral law of God say about the depth of your love for the Savior? Are you attempting, with, out of love for Him, to, to follow His moral law? What do we see in the next verse? This is critical for where this chapter is heading, because once we're free from the law, in that sense, in the sense that we understand and believe our stand before God is based on Christ's righteousness, not ours, we can actually get closer to the law without being afraid of it. You know, that, that's, uh, what do I mean by that? It's the opposite of being, what, what is the opposite of being authentic? You know, I've asked you the question, what is authentic? What's the opposite of that? Well, shallow, fake, inauthentic. It's, it's a huge, it's a huge um, mark against Christianity, right? What do you often hear people say? You're trying to share the gospel, perhaps, or invite them to church, and you'll hear Christians are so hypocritical. You know, they say they go to church, and they do this. Uh, they say one thing and do another. They're just, they're just hypocrites. It's just a terrible thing. You know, 
the opposite of being authentic is to be all of those things, shallow and fake and inauthentic. But Paul sort of gives us an explanation of this, or example, if you will, in Philippians chapter 3, where he tells us, he basically gives his pedigree. He says, I am a, a circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. He, he lists all these things but that by definition people would be like, whoa, this guy is really somebody. But that's putting confidence in the flesh. He goes on to say that he counts all those things but lost, but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of God. And so when we try to be our own Savior by keeping the law in our own strength, we invariably must, must devalue or have a shallow view of, of sin. If, if we are trying to, to keep it, if we're trying to, to do the law and keep it in our own strength, we have to lessen it because we're not successful in keeping it. Does that make sense? So, so you, you keep the law at arm's length because it shatters the illusion of self-righteousness. In other words, you can't keep the law. You can't do it in and of yourself. You don't want to be honest about the depth of your heart struggles because that makes achieving self-righteousness harder. That's what happens when we, when we, we try to, to obey in the flesh. Friends, we don't have to do that anymore. We're freed from the law and married to Christ. So we can actually get closer to the law without being afraid of it. That's what Paul does in the next verse, uh, verse 7. And this is my third point. You're free to be authentic because your sin has already been exposed. Your sin's already been exposed. There's, there's no need to hide it. When it says in verse uh, 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. This is the opposite of, of what we do with the law if we're living in the flesh. You know, we, we, we have a habit of looking at the law and we, we're trying to, to justify our innocence. You know, well, I keep that commandment and I keep that commandment and I, I keep that commandment. Well, at least I have kept that one, you know, which may be why of all the Ten Commandments, the Holy Spirit could reveal to us here, the one that Paul mentions, which one singled out? It's covetousness. That's probably the most inward, if you will, of the ten. We can't really weasel out of that one. But we don't even have to try. If we're secure in our union with Christ, then we can really get after it by admitting the fact that this is a struggle and we need God's help and we need His forgiveness. And Paul essentially is saying here, the law incited rebellion in his heart. But sin, verse 8, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin is dead. Every parent knows exactly what this means. <laughs> what do you mean? Just tell your child not to touch something. And then what does that child become consumed with? Little, little five-year-old Jared was sitting in granddad's 1960 Chevrolet pickup truck. And he took me to the grocery store. And he left me in the truck. And he says, Jared, don't touch that gear shift. Like, okay, sure. You know, granddad gets out of the car. And all of a sudden, that gear shift becomes the most beautiful thing in the world. And I want to touch it. I want to move it. Why did he say not to do it? If he hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have thought nothing of it. He said, don't touch it. So I go to that, and I start moving it. And unfortunately, the parking lot of the grocery store was declining towards the store. And so as soon as I jiggled it, I realized why I shouldn't touch it. Now, there are safety measures in place these days. You can't do that. But I took that truck out of gear, and off I went towards the grocery store. And I saw my grandfather racing towards it. He dropped everything he had, and he was running out to the truck, and I knew I was in trouble. He got in the truck. He left all the groceries. He started it up. He took me home, and that's the first and last time my granddad ever spanked me and disciplined me. And boy, he would never have to do it again because <laughs> I was in big trouble. But why did I do that? I just had to touch that, that gear shift because that's exactly what I was not supposed to do. Verse 9 says, For I was in, alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. H how does it do this? Well, the basic answer is, we are but sinners. You know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's this perversity about our hearts. Perversity is the desire to do something for no other reason than because it is forbidden. 
It is a joy in wrongdoing for its own sake. It's like a, a cat, my goodness, a cat that sees this cup of water right here and for no other reason knocks it off so that to make a mess. It's not allowed. Why would you do that? I don't really care for cats. If you're a cat lover, you're probably just going to shut off the rest of the sermon now, right? God doesn't like cats. Not going to listen to them. I hope you will agree with me that this is true, though, that, that we are bent to wrong by nature. And what makes it easier to admit it? Being secure in our union with Christ. I know I have that nature. I know that I have to keep a short sin account. I know that if I confess my sins, that He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, then I don't pretend to be anything else. I am a sinner saved by grace. And I am growing in the Lord. And I still struggle. And I'm so thankful that I'm secure because of Him. And I can stand before you this morning, even preaching God's Word behind this pulpit, and say I am a sinner. And I do have struggles. But I can be authentic about that because Jesus Christ has taken care of that because of my faith in what He did on the cross for my sin. And that's a comfort. We're free to be authentic. The problem was never the law, but your sin which was revealed and magnified. Verse 13 says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But for, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sorrowful. One commentator said, the villain of the peace is sin. Sin sees the opportunity afforded it when the law showed me what was right and what was wrong. Why aren't followers of Christ afraid to admit the struggle? Because we know that it is His righteousness that we are now clothed in. He's our ticket to heaven. And when we die and stand before God, He will see His Son, Jesus Christ, and will welcome you because of His righteousness. Not, not yours. It's imputed to you. But you're a sinner. But you're a sinner saved by grace. I love that old hymn. I actually can't, I, I can't think of the tune, but I wrote the lyrics down. Free from the law, O happy condition. Jesus has bled, and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O friend, now believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. Amen. Amen. I hope you're thankful for your salvation. Now, how does this end? This passage ends with an incredible illustration. You're free to be authentic because your struggle can be and is addressed. Isn't it amazing and refreshing that the Apostle Paul can be honest about the power and presence of, 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 of this indwelling sin? He, he, he's being authentic when he says in verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And then verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. I would ask this question. Is Paul speaking here as an unsaved man? Is he speaking here as an immature, carnal Christian? Or is he speaking here as a mature Christian? He's very much speaking as a mature Christian. That kind of authenticity is a sign of significant maturity. The more seriously a Christian strives to live from grace and to submit to the discipline of the gospel, the more sensitive he becomes to the fact that even his very best acts and, 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 and very best activities are disfigured in some sense by this egotism or pride, if you will, that is still powerful within us. And, and the fact is, it's, it's, almost, it's no less evil because sometimes it's just subtle a lot. But to be able to say, uh, I, I still struggle with these things, but I'm so thankful that I'm covered by the blood of Christ and I want to get them right and I know that walking with Him will help me do this. It leads to a pretty straightforward question. Do you have this kind of openness about the ways that you need to change and the ways that you need to grow? Are you able to say, man, I struggle with this area? Because what happens a lot of times is we don't want to admit that we struggle. We don't want to admit, for, for some reason, it, it makes us feel as though we are, we're not very good Christians. We're, but I tell you what, I've known a lot of good Christians who are open about their struggles. And I've known a lot of sour Christians who were quiet about the fact that they had any issue at all. 
You know, and, and we, need to, we need to pray for one another. We need to encourage one another, exhort one another. When you're looking at your fellow church members, you need to be patient and understand that nobody's perfect. We all struggle. We all have sin issues that, that we are working on. Let's let the depth of the struggle cause us to continually cry out to our victorious Savior because we love Him. You know, I have learned the closer I get to the Lord when I do sin, I immediately know it and I don't like it and I want to get it right with Him. And I want to get it right with whoever perhaps I have offended or, or sinned against. And I can do that because my, my salvation is secure. If I come to you and I say, brother, I'm sorry that I have done this and, and it, it was wrong and I, I hope you'll forgive me. And I, I've done what's necessary biblically to get that right. And because my salvation is secure, I'm not even worried about that. I know if, even if I had committed sin and died right after and didn't have a chance to get it right, my salvation is already secure because of Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Paul says in verse 24, and I can echo it, and I hope that you can echo it as well. He says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I came across an illustration studying that verse, and I, I don't know if it's exactly true or, or sure, but... It's been said that in this area near where Paul was born, that when a certain, a certain person would commit a crime or murder, there was a tribe in that area that would then, if the person was convicted, would strap the carcass of the person they killed to their back. And the decay and disease and infection of that dead body would then end up taking the life of the one who committed the murder. So it's dreadful to even think about that. But if you, if you can imagine... When you see who shall deliver me from the body of this death, isn't that viv a vivid picture of, of what Paul is experiencing here? O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Regardless, the, the struggle is real if we're honest about it. And what frees us to do, do right is, and have, be authentic about it is the security that we have with Christ. And that's why the chapter closes with verse 25. I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So how about it? Back to question number one when I opened this morning. Are you authentic? Admitting the struggle, admitting the sin is, and being able to get it right with God and confess it is absolutely key to living victoriously as a Christian. If you try to put on this facade of perfection, that there's, there's no struggle, no problem with sin. You will frustrate the fire out of yourself. Nobody is able to sit on that pedestal. Nobody is perfect. Uh, and yet sometimes by default, while well, you say, I'm a mature Christian. I've been saved for decades. I'm a leader in the church. You know what? Don't put yourself on a pedestal of perfection. Haven't you heard that before? You never put a man on a pedestal, not even a good pastor, good preacher, good evangelist. They all struggle. We are all able to be authentic about that because we're secure in our salvation with Jesus Christ. There is wonderful peace in going to bed at night wearing the imputed righteousness of Christ. And, but there's even a sweeter sleep when you know that you're right with Christ. When you can pray before bed and say, Father, please forgive me for, for this, or to get your heart right and, and to know you're at peace, not just your salvation is secure, but that you love Jesus, you love your spouse, and you want to do those things that please Him. More likely in a crowd like this on a Sunday morning is that we tend to perform obedience out of duty. We know we're supposed to do it. We know we're supposed to come to church. We know we're supposed to give our tithes and offerings. We know that we're supposed to pray. And in the life of a Christian, sometimes we just do it out of obedience. But I want you to think of it as doing it out of love for the Lord. It changes. Maybe you have no trouble giving your tithes and offerings because you have lots of money in the bank account. But if you gave that because you loved Jesus because you loved him and you prayed as you put that offering and say, God, would you use this to spread the gospel? Would you use this to reach the lost? Would you use this to help the ministry of our church go forward? And you gave not because it was the right, out of just mere obedience, but you gave out of love for the Lord. Sometimes obedience is what's required. No, don't get me wrong. It's important to, to do these things out of obedience, but it's, it just changes the whole picture when you're doing it out of love for your spouse because of what they did for you. Love for Jesus Christ. We are all pretty bad people who only do right by the grace of God. 
It's a good study. I, I've done it several times. It's called uh, Changed into His Image uh, by Dr. Jim Berg. It's a great study, but that, he says that quite constantly in the first several chapters. We're all pretty bad people who only do right by the grace of God, and he just keeps hammering you down and hammering you down. And I say he, but he uses Scripture to do it, right? Because that's what we are. We're all imperfect people, but we are wearing the imputed righteousness of Christ, and that is a wonderful, wonderful truth. I'm so glad to be dead to the law, to not have to keep it to keep my salvation, but I'm so glad also I have opportunity through the power of the Holy Spirit to do the law in order to please the Father, in in order to, to make him happy. Now, if you don't know the Lord this morning, that's obviously step number one. A lot of times we often forget that perhaps we're sitting among someone who's never placed their faith and trust in Christ. If you've never made that decision this morning to trust Christ as your Savior, the wonderful thing is today is the day to do that. Now is the time of salvation. You don't have to leave the doors of this auditorium without knowing 100% for sure that you're a child of God. Jesus came. He died on the cross. He was a perfect substitute for our sin. He took upon the, yourself. He took upon himself our sin and paid for that sin on the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again. And he's alive today. And he wants to save you. If you're not saved, I hope that you are. Father, thank you for the, the time that you've given us this morning. And Lord, I pray.